In this episode of Mississippi Roads, we'll celebrate the 300th anniversary of Natchez. We'll start by visiting Emerald Mound, one of the largest Native American mounds in the nation. And then we'll take a look at how the Mississippi River helped the city prosper, as well as how the city has thrived from its tourism. Down Mississippi Road. Well, hi, I'm Walt Grayson, and welcome back to Mississippi Roads. Now, we have a special program for you this week. I don't think we've ever done one like this before. Well, <laughs> matter of fact, I'm sure we've not done one like this before because Natchez has never turned 300 years old before. And that's the occasion. We're in the city of Natchez, the oldest city on the Mississippi River, commemorating the tricentennial. And we're starting off on top of Ellicott Hill. And the reason we're at Ellicott Hill is because in 1797, Andrew Ellicott first raised the American flag over Natchez on top of this hill. The only thing was, in 1797, when he raised that flag, Natchez had already been here for 80 years. We'd gone through three owners before then, the Spanish, prior to the Spanish, the English, prior to the English, the French. Prior to the French, the Natchez Indians. The Natchez Indians had a culture so well developed they had time to build places like this, Emerald Mound. It's over eight acres at the top, second largest mound in the nation. Plus, it has even higher mounds on either end, one taller than the other. I came up with one of my three second archeological theories here at Emerald Mounds one time. I was out here doing a story and had a couple archeologists with me. One says the small mound back over here behind me was used by the chief, that was where he had his house. And then the other mound, the large mound, was where the priest lived. And then the other archeologist says, no, 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 I think they had the temple on the large mound. And then the small mound over here is where the chief lived. I told him, fellas, no, you got it all wrong. The small mound is where the visitors sat. The large mound is where the home team sat. And then they played out here in the middle. And they looked at me for about three seconds and then they said, no, we really think that they had a temple on the small mound. Now, there was a time that my half-baked theory would have been about as good as any of the other theories about Emerald Mound because there were no written records or instructions or anything about what went on here left by the people who used it. Obviously, it must have been ceremonial and civic and religious rituals were held here. And I've heard stories from people who've talked to people who say they've heard handed down oral histories. And some of them are pretty far-fetched. But by the time the Europeans got here and started writing things down, the Natchez had already abandoned Emerald Mound, as well as every other tribe had abandoned every other mound site in the nation, except one. And it's just right down the road from here, the Grand Village of the Natchez Indians. So the Emerald Mound would have been uh, created by the ancestors of the Natchez people. Uh, there's a variety of different mound sites located in Adams County and in southwest Mississippi. So Emerald Mound had been abandoned by the time the Europeans began to wander down the Mississippi River from Canada in the mid-1600s. But the Grand Village of the Natchez Indians on the banks of St. Catharines Creek inside present-day Natchez was still in use. Matter of fact, the major significance of the Grand Village is that it was the only mound center still being used when the European explorers got here, and that's important because the explorers wrote down what they saw. The buildings, the rituals, the day-to-day -day activity of the way the village worked, and from what was recorded here, it's been extrapolated that pretty much those same kinds of things must have been going on at all the other mound centers all over the Mississippi Valley. But of direct importance to present-day city of Natchez, French explorers who had landed on the Mississippi Gulf Coast in 1699 and then over the next 15 or so years had wandered out and established trade connections with Native Americans all over the place, including here at the Grand Village, liked this area so much they came here and established a fort, Fort Rosalie, in August of 1716. And it's from the establishment of Fort Rosalie that Natchez dates its origin.
Okay, the collection is called Gandhi Collection. Dr. Gandhi and his wife, um, Joan Gandhi, they are the ones that found the original prints and the plates and had them restored to what you see here. Incredible value just to have them preserved as they are, the snippets of history that just go forgotten. I like the children in that room over there, just the expressions and the diversity of the children. And they're African American and Asian and, and Caucasian. Natchez is a different kind of place. Maybe it's the isolation. You don't like the remote Galapagos Islands and their unique animal life evolving so isolated on their own. Well, Natchez started out very isolated and it's not that easy to get to now. There are no interstate highways nearby. But early on, there was one primary way to get to Natchez, the Mississippi River. And when you left, you pretty much had to walk back home on the Natchez Trace. Natchez writer Greg Isles says that was the beginning of the uniqueness of Natchez. First, it comes from the river. We're up on the high ground, the highest ground until you get up to Missouri, I think. Um, the Indians settled here. Everybody knew this was an ideal place. It was above the yellow fever. It was just a lot of positive things about it. But what really makes it different is that it has always been an island of license and liberality in a state otherwise known for its blue laws and conservatism. And that comes from the fact that it was settled by the English and the French early on. And there was a lot of wealth here before there was ever wealth in the Delta or anywhere else in the state. And that, that created a situation where, because it was an Anglophilic city, people sent their children to the best universities in the land. They sent them to the courts of Europe. So you tended to have a more educated population here right on through, I think, till World War II, when we had a pretty big influx of uh, labor to work in the paper mill and the tire plant and things that were put up. So that defined the character of Natchez. So you had the river bringing all sorts of people to Natchez, some staying, some passing through, like flatboatsmen selling what they brought, then selling their boats for use as wood for buildings. And then they walked back home on the Natchez Trace. Others fleeing the eastern seaboard in the gathering Revolutionary War, loyal to the crown, walked here on the trace. Then there were outlaws making their own Natchez down below the bluff on the riverfront, Natchez under the hill, with the rest of Natchez all simmering in the same pot with African slaves and South Louisiana trappers and free men of color until 1811 when the world changed. The steamboat was invented. Not only then could the river bring people to Natchez from upstream, with steam, it could take them back home upstream. And not only people, but cotton. What I would like for people to understand is how complicated history is. That um, this was an era when if you had certain attributes, you can make a whole lot of money. And if you had um, the unfortunate circumstance to be born and sold into slavery in Africa, your life could be a living hell. Or you could lose your life very easily. It wasn't yours. It, was, it seems so capricious to us now. Roughly one million enslaved people were either uh, purchased, ill-gotten, bought, stolen, or what have from the eastern seaboard in the upper Midwest states such as Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, and one of the places where they were intended to come of the destination was the Forks of the Road. The Forks of the Road was a huge slave market on the outskirts of Natchez. Raising cotton is a labor-intensive undertaking. We have machinery, they had slaves on the antebellum plantations. Sir Boxley's dedicated much of his life preserving the forks of the road so he can understand the contribution of the slave, only he'd take offense to that catch-all term slave to lose sight that these were people, individuals, just like us. There would be no Mississippi uh, for white folks. There would be no natural for white folks and other folks, black folks for that matter, and anybody who's benefiting today if it wasn't for slavery, cattle slavery as such. And so that point has got to be taken away from here. Bottom line is the stolen humanity of African descendants, our folk, parents, and our ancestors that this site speaks to as such. 
Cotton brought wealth to Natchez, but it came at a price, slavery. But Southern cotton brought wealth to the nation, not just Southern plantation owners. The dark side of Natchez that's beginning to be given its rightful place in the history of the city is the role slavery played. The, the planters who lived in Natchez in the 1840s and early 1850s were the wealthiest people in the United States. And so they could buy the finest things that money could buy. And because we have the Mississippi River right here, it could all be shipped right to their doorsteps. And people are astonished by the scales of these mansions, where the ceilings can be 15 feet high and the rooms can be 30 feet across. And, and when you drill down and look at the details of that, it becomes more and more amazing that those, those rooms that are 30 feet across have cypress floors that are one board the entire length. Just the size and the grandeur of those things is amazing. And that inside, they had the finest things money could buy. They had very fine uh, American furniture with French silk on it and beautiful French gilded mirrors and beautiful European china. I mean, there is an opulence here that we would expect to see in Newport or at Biltmore or some of the other finest mansions in the United States. Not many Southern planters that owned a mansion uh, ever laid a brick. And his brother-in-law didn't come down for the summer or winter to help him. But trust me, every one of these mansions were built on the back of so-called slaves. Most of them by that time, though, were freed or had, or had freedom uh, in their pockets, so to speak. But they built, and they were artisans. They made their bricks, they made their moldings, they made, they made what they put together. And now we're showing it off like it's all ours. It belongs to them just as much as it does to the owners. You know, the shorthand understanding of society of the Old South, as it's been sifted down to us today, 150 years later, is if you were white, you were free. If you were black, you were a slave. But that's not entirely true. There was a colony of free people of color in Natchez. One branch of the Natchez National Park illustrates that at the William Johnson House downtown. William Johnson was a mixed race person who was born into slavery. Um, we assume that his father was the plantation owner named William Johnson, though that's nowhere written down. And the plantation owner granted freedom to um, William Johnson's mother, to his sister Adelia, and to young William when he was about nine years old. And these people joined a community of about 200 free people of color here in Natchez, and it was the largest community of free people of color in the state of Mississippi. And they sort of occupied a middle class status. And so they valued learning. William Johnson was very literate. We don't know how he learned to read and write. But what he is primarily known for is his work as a diarist, that between 1835 and 1851, he kept daily journals of what was going on in Natchez. And, you know, he was a barber. And if you think about the gossip that goes through a barber shop, <laughs> it's fascinating reading. You find out not only who's running around with who, who's losing money at the racetrack, which politicians are having fist fights in the street. It's quite fascinating. Slavery ultimately led to the Civil War. The right to own slaves is primarily the state right that's often referred to in history books as the sanitized reason for the war, fighting over states' rights. But even in the Civil War, Natchez ended up being unique. One Natchez historian put it this way, Natchez surrendered early and often. When I was in 11th grade, I was a delegate to Boys State in Jackson, Hines Junior College. And I sensed a sort of prejudice against me and the other boys from Natchez, particularly the boys from Vicksburg. And I finally realized it was because we had surrendered early and well, and they had suffered through the siege. Actually, there was a battle casualty in Natchez in the Civil War, just one. A Union gunboat shelled the city in a dispute over ice, and 12-year-old Rosalie Beekman was caught by a piece of shrapnel and bled to death. She's the only person who died in Natchez in the Civil War in battle. And she's buried here in Natchez City Cemetery. Well, not only is little Rosalie Beekman buried here, but there's a hundred acres of other folks who are here. Nobles, big noble, <laughs> aristocratic folks. There's governors here, governors of Mississippi, governors of the Spanish territory over across the river. Generals of all kinds, Civil War soldiers, 
every other kind of soldier. There's tombstones with epitaphs that are continued on the back, some of them are so long. And then there's some whose story's short, but says a lot, like this one. Louise Period, The Unfortunate. Volume spoken in just these three words. Natchez has its own familiarity. It, it is structured around community. Natchez is, in one word, family. Um, the structure of Natchez has always been surrounded around a historic venue. But the true history of Natchez are the people that tell the story, the people that are involved in the story, from all genres, generations, ethnicities, religion. We've always found a way to make Natchez happen. There's, there's wildness, there's incredible sophistication, there's music, there's art, there's culture, that, and, and yet it has, it has maintained a sense of small town and a sense of, of um, something that you don't see everywhere else. After the Civil War and on into Reconstruction, the old cotton money was gone by and large. The mansion still stood, but the families were on their own to survive. The lively, happy island of wealth and sustainability that was antebellum Natchez was gone. The spirit of the town was just a shadow of itself until the Great Depression years, when something entirely new came to town. Tourist. <laughs> Perhaps it was interest in the Old South generated by romanticized stories being produced by Hollywood in the 1930s that generated an interest in places like Natchez. Between that and good all-weather roads beginning to connect to all parts of the nation, pilgrims flocked to Natchez, at first to see the gardens in bloom for spring. But one year there came a late freeze and the town was already full of tourists, so the gardens were abandoned and the doors to the old homes thrown wide open and the pilgrims have toured the interiors since then. It was the coming of the pilgrimage in the 1930s that helped save many of these old homes. During that 50 years after the 30s, the world was populated with a lot of ladies, blue-haired ladies, whose greatest fantasy was gone with the wind. And they came here by the thousands to see the pilgrimage, and the pilgrimage was pretty much an unapologetic celebration of the antebellum South. And that leaves out 50% of Natchez's population. So it's always been a sort of schizophrenic thing here. And only in the last few years have we really started to rectify that. The biggest criticism of the pilgrimage in Natchez was that it didn't tell the whole story about antebellum days, particularly about slavery. But initially, the pilgrimage wasn't designed to tell a story at all. Because Natchez, unlike Vicksburg, was not defended by the Confederacy during the Civil War, it was not shelled and destroyed by the Union Army during the Civil War. So we still walk among the physical remnants of that culture. It's still very much here with us. The houses are still here. The churches are still here. And, and in, in Natchez, when you hear the whistle of a steamboat leaving or you hear the, the, the sound of the horse hooves on the horse-drawn carriages, it's very evocative of a time period that's still with us, you know. When the, when the ladies of Natchez first opened their homes to visiting guests, it was very much about hospitality. It was very much an ethos of welcoming people into your homes, and it would have been the height of rudeness to discuss difficult things like that. In a parallel track has developed the real kind of historic interpretation where we no longer, on, in this track over here, we no longer have to sell a fantasy. We no longer have to make people feel like you are, you're good enough folks that you can come in the front door of this house. Right now, it's that you are an American, this is a national park, you own this place. So let's come in and really talk about some things that matter. Fortunate side is Natchez is uniquely situated to take advantage of the growing segment of tourism, which is heritage tourism. Uh, that's a great thing, but in order to take advantage of that, and, and not out of 
reasons of greed, but in order to be fair to our own citizens and be to sort of undistort our history, as it were, we are going to have to change completely the face that we present to the world. And that is a part of the reasoning behind making a big deal out of the 300th anniversary year of the city of Natchez. To take this year to have events and do projects, not so much to change the face of Natchez that the world sees, but to make sure the world sees all of the faces of Natchez. Jennifer Ogden Combs came home this year from Hollywood as a movie producer to head up the Tricentennial Commission for her hometown because she believes this is the time to make this happen and the 300th anniversary is the vehicle to use to get all of Natchez on board. Natchez is an interesting place. It's a very unique place. It's a very, un I mean, aside from the history, it's a very unusual small town that's got a lot of sophistication and and much bigger feel than a small normal small town. And I thought, what would be something that could bring everybody together, that would really serve and be about everybody? This is a year that not many places can claim this kind of 300th birthday and we could use that to bring our community together to celebrate and to commemorate. This is not my story or the city story, the county story, or the Garden Club story, or the Grand Village story. It's all of our story. It's the slavery story. It's the civil rights story. It is about all of us. It's about telling all of our story and celebrating our stories and certainly commemorating them as well because some of the history is our history isn't necessarily something you celebrate, but you learn from it by commemorating it and sharing it and, and then using that to create a better, more united future for Natchez and Adams County. Natchez is a national treasure, and it is my mission to make this treasure shine. There is a wealth of history. There's a wealth of architecture. There is a wealth of aesthetics that we have here in Natchez. And it's my plan to make the people who are autochthonous of this community appreciate this community, enhance this community, and bring people here like a Savannah, like a Charleston, show the world the beauty and the aesthetics. And not only just Natchez, but our contiguous communities. We have great counties that surround us, and uh, we just need to take advantage of all of the things that we have to offer here in Natchez. Natchez, Mississippi's had 300 years of relative isolation in modern day terms to come up with some unique architecture and some unique places and some unique history and lore to go along with those places. We do have St. Mary's, which is beautiful, beautiful Catholic church um, and was the seat of the Catholic faith for many years in Mississippi before the diocese moved to Jackson. Natchez is so filled with landmarks, it's, it's hard to even cover them. What I, what I would advise is I like the smaller things like the Turning Angel that I named one of my books after. The cemetery at Natchez is just one of the greatest in the whole country to see. I like the cemetery myself. <laughs> like it so much, I've been locked in there twice. Wait a second, you've been locked in the city cemetery? Well, I never thought it was something to brag about before. Um, Longwood, of course, completely unique. This house here, completely unique. Uh, but, but I think people should just come for the feel. You know, Savannah has its own feel, Charleston has a feel, Natchez has a similar feel, New Orleans. And, and those are those are rare. You know, we live, Walt, you know this, you travel around, that's your job. It, we've reached the point, it's what I tell people on book tour, if I'm in California or Maine or anywhere, I say, anywhere I get off the plane, I almost can't even tell where I am because everywhere looks the same. Everywhere feels the same. Same franchise restaurants, same outdoor mall, same whatever. When you get off the plane in Mississippi, you know you're somewhere, right? And when you get out, when you come to Natchez, even in Mississippi, you know you're somewhere special. This is the new Bridge of Size in Natchez. It's part of the Riverwalk, and this bridge is one of the 300th anniversary projects. And speaking of 300th anniversary, it's amazing how little bit of 300 years you can cram down into 30 minutes worth of television, but that's all the time we have for the show. But if you'd like information about anything you've seen, not only on this Mississippi Road show, but on any of them, you can contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads. And while you're at your computer, go ahead and hit a like on our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. I think while I'm here, I'm gonna look around Natchez a little bit more. But until next time, I'm Walt Grayson. I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads.
Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.